Hey YouTube, this is Mr. Terry. Um, today we're checking out Oversimplified's World War II video, uh, part one. So we're going to check this out. Uh, of course, World War II is probably the most popular war that uh, people know. Um, but even as, even as a history teacher, I'm always learning new things and um, love doing that because uh, it's such, I mean, really a big part of history. So let's go ahead and check this out. Um, Right now. It's 1902. A young man by the name of Benito Mussolini moves from Italy to Switzerland to avoid military service. He gets big into socialism, working for trade right. unions, writing for socialist newspapers, advocating a violent overthrow of European monarchies, the whole shebang. This gets him in a bit of trouble with the Swiss police, so he gets arrested, sent back to Italy, set free, returns to Switzerland, is arrested again, goes back to Italy again, completes his military People service after previously avoiding it, and know, then after a brief stint as an elementary school teacher, he finally returns to work as an avid socialist. His speeches and journalistic abilities made him famous among Italian socialists. He was anti-war, so when Italy colonized Libya in 1910, he rioted and got arrested. Then World War I came along, and once again he protested Italy's involvement. But then he thought, wait a minute, this war could bring about the social climate needed to overthrow European monarchies and bring about the socialist revolution everywhere. So, we all know who Mussolini is going to become later. And a lot of us know about Hitler, you know, and they're going to talk about him, I'm sure, here soon. But it's amazing what World War II taught us about what war does to potentially change people. I mean, you have Benito, Benito Mussolini is an anti-war activist. Um, and of course, we know the, the dictator that he's going to become. Um, but it's, yeah, again, truly amazing what war can do to people um, and totally change their outlook on a lot of things. So, of course, we want to find out with people like Hitler and Mussolini, what is it about war or whatever that is going to change them into the people they are going to become after? Because they're obviously going to be very different people. So um, hopefully they get into that and suddenly he was pro-war. But his fellow socialists didn't like his new pro-war stance, so they kicked him out of the party. So then he said, you know what? I'm done with socialism. We need something new, not based on class divisions tearing us apart, but based on unity through nationality. We'll conquer the Mediterranean and reunite all Italian peoples, just like the days of the Roman Empire. I'll call it fascismo, and it will guide the Italian nation to greatness. That's all well and good, Mr. Mussolini, fascism. but what kind of haircut am I giving you? Let's go with... Bold. <laughs> You know, when you're losing your hair, eventually you just got to embrace it. Go full, blow, uh, full, full bald. All right, here we go. Italy had been on the winner's side in World War I, and they hoped they were going to get a lot out of it. But in the end, they only got a little, and they felt cheated. On top of that, a bad economy and weak governments meant that the Italian people were a little unhappy. So when Mussolini came along and said that he could fix everything, his fascist movement gained a lot of support. In 1922, he went to the king and said, Make me prime minister, or I'll make me prime minister. And the king said, You and what army? This army. <laughs> Fair enough. Then he went about establishing a dictatorship with himself at its center. Europe had its first fascist dictator. Next up, Duce. Germany. Germany had been on the loser's side, and they got absolutely wrecked by the Treaty of Versailles. They lost territory, had to demilitarize the Rhineland, had to reduce their army to just 100,000 men, couldn't have an air force, had to pay the Allies a huge amount of money that it didn't have, and a new rule was established that every Englishman withheld the right to walk into the center of Berlin, pick out any German they wanted, and spank the hell out of them. I made that last one up, but it helps you understand how all of this felt to Germans. Okay, so... Treaty of Versailles, right? If you know about World War II, you understand that there were um, so many leftover problems that the Treaty of Versailles created that ended World War One. And what you saw here, which is uh, important to understand, is Italy was on the winning side and Germany was on the losing side. But both felt that because of what happened after the war that they were on the losing side with um, Italy having kind of flip-flopped during World War I, and then eventually joining the Allied side because of a promise to gain new territories you saw uh, a few frames ago, and not getting that after the war, um, which, you know, upset a lot of people like Mussolini, who had fought and died and felt like it was kind of for nothing. Then, of course, Germany has by far the biggest reason to be upset because um, there's a statement in the treaty that says that they have to take full blame for the war, um, as well as pay for the war, which, of course, they don't have the money for that after the war. And, you know, it's easy to make to um, see that they would feel victimized here. But uh, people often forget with Italy um, what, what had happened there. So, but yep, the Germans, I think, definitely feel like this poor stick figure is right now. 
On top of that, a bad economy and weak governments meant that when a small angry man with a silly mustache came along and said that he could fix everything, the German people loved it. Hitler had been a soldier during World War I, and he was crazy patriotic, and nobody was madder than him about Germany's humiliation. He helped start a new political party, and in 1923 attended a march on Munich with his boys and then he got arrested. But his popularity grew and grew, and in 1933, the president made him chancellor. He believed he was Germany's great destined savior, and he went full megalomaniac, establishing a dictatorship with himself at its center. Europe had fascist dictator number two. Hitler and Mussolini had a lot of the same ideas, but more Let's go and look at these real quick, because this is uh, important to look at when you look at the, the two who both, as you saw, claim that they can fix the problems that are created after World War II, or uh, World War I. Um, and Hitler is very influenced by Mussolini, who, you know, he tried to emulate some as kind of the senior fascist. Um, but you saw with uh, a, a few seconds ago how um, Mussolini's takeover went pretty well, right? He had the military behind him. He had much longer support, larger support than Hitler did in the 20s. And uh, yeah, he was influenced by that. Hitler was and tried to do his own little military overthrow. Um, but the German government was having none of that. Of course, he gets thrown in jail. Um, they didn't. They kind of. They didn't really talk about that. Where he also um, writes Mein Kampf and kind of outlines a lot of these things as you're seeing on the left hand of the screen here. Uh, so yeah, you can see <clears throat> see these two guys are going to be gaining popularity with again similar things. Now fascism is hard to sometimes define, and the things you're seeing right here on the screen is often what historians will say. Uh, are kind of features of fascism so that's what we kind of have to go for but it's still a very debatable term about what it's used and it gets thrown around so much these days and people don't really understand it but uh if we're looking in the historical sense we're kind of looking here on the screen um by, sorry my webcam is blocking the left side but the left side is the same as the right side here so anyway importantly they had the same enemies and they started to get along anyone else want to be friends franco no you good i do Who's that? It's Japan, and they've taken over northern China. Let's rewind a bit. Japan's already. Yep. Japan had isolated Starting itself from the rest process. of the world for over 200 years until the Americans showed up and said, you're going to trade with us and you're going to like it. Then the Western Matthew powers Perry, imposed a bunch of unequal treaties, meaning Japan's economy was bust. They also had no natural resources, so they decided to go get some. They went to war with China to gain a sphere of influence over Korea, and they took a bunch of China's stuff. But then the West said, hey, Cut that out. And since Japan couldn't take on the West, they said, okay, I guess we'll just go home. Wait a minute, what are you doing? Taking advantage of a weakened China and setting up spheres of influence. But I was the one who weakened them. We know. And you guys didn't let me have anything. We know. That seems unfair. We don't think so. Okay, see ya. So Japan... Go ahead and add Japan then to the list of people that were pissed off after World War One. Japan joins on the Allied side because um, they're hoping to get uh, colonial possessions, you know, out in... Uh, in Asia and had done so, but uh, were kind of denied by the other allies um, this kind of blessing to to have these or keep these these colonies there. So they add that to Germany, add that to now to Italy. Um, Japan adding the third part of that are people that are upset and kind of feel they have to take matters into their own hands if they want to be a power nation, which of course all three want to do thought screw this and went to war with Russia and stunned everyone by actually winning. Then they fully annexed Korea, but they didn't stop there. In World War I, they took Germany's colonies and islands in Asia. And then in an incident that was maybe staged by the Japanese army, a bomb blew up a Japanese train in Manchuria, giving them an excuse to launch an invasion and take over. So here's the situation. Nazi Germany, fascist Italy, and Japan all believe they're racially superior, all feel hostility towards the allies, and all want to militarize and take over more stuff. And so they did. Let's start with Germany. Hitler hated the Treaty of Versailles, and now he was ready to begin on doing it. In complete violation of the treaty, the first Luftwaffe squadrons were set up, conscription was introduced, and he pimped up his army. The Allies did nothing. Then Hitler sent his... He did this in secrecy um, at first, using, you know, to make these these factories for war materials, which again was, was illegal according to the Treaty of Versailles, but or would hide them in uh, factories and things that were disguised as like schools, for example, um, to keep this kind of under wraps. So he's kind of had, had been doing this. Um, then you see here the first time he really unleashes, I guess, this new military he's been building is here with the Rhineland, which uh, was a territory here on, if you can see my mouse, kind of on the border here of Germany and France, that was a demilitarized zone um, that Germany was not allowed to have military in. Uh, but 
Hitler felt was vital to the future of Germany to have this region back. So you see it, and then, yep, they're going to talk about how uh, the Allies kind of do nothing about it. His army back into the demilitarized Rhineland, giving orders to immediately retreat if the Allies showed up. The Allies did nothing. With his military re-strengthened, he could now move on to step two. He wanted to rapidly increase the Aryan population, and to do so, he needed Lebensraum. Or in other words, he would have to take over the world. But for now, a good portion Living of Europe space. would do, and he began eyeing up his neighbors. The Allies finally started to get worried, so they implemented a fairly useless diplomatic strategy called appeasement, and it went a little something like this. Hitler would say, I want that thing. And the Allies would say, you can't have that thing. Okay, you can have that thing, but no more. I want that thing. And repeat. In 1938, Hitler's army marched into Austria and just took it, with no resistance. Boom, this is Germany now. Next, he demanded to be given the Sudetenland, an area of Czechoslovakia with many ethnic Germans. The Allies held a meeting with Hitler in Munich and said, Look, we're going to give you what you... Hang on, this meeting is about my territory. Shouldn't I come to the meeting too? Anyway, we're going to give you what you want. <laughs> really? Yeah. Just like that? Yep. What's the catch? Just sign this piece of paper promising you won't invade the rest of Czechoslovakia. That'll okay. work, right? Then Chamberlain returned home victorious, waving his signed piece of paper in the air, declaring crisis to be averted and the continuation of world peace, and we built a statue of Chamberlain in his honor, and every day on the 30th of September we celebrate Chamberlain Day. Hitler's invading the rest of Czechoslovakia. What? He's invading the rest of Czechoslovakia. Oh. You lied to me. What do you expect? I'm Hitler. Not to be outdone, Mussolini... <laughs> now, history has definitely put uh, Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain... Uh, in this really bad light, of course, because, of course, in hindsight, we understand that this this policy of appeasement and, you know, basically trying to make Hitler promise that, OK, you can have these areas that are uh, majority ethnic German, but you can't go any further than that. And again, Chamberlain gets a bad rap for that. Um, now, understand at this time that if the Allies had actually militarily intervened with Germany. Um, the public probably would not have supported it this time because, again, you got to think, World War I ended less than 20 years ago, um, and people are not wanting, to, of course, to, to go to war. People thought that nobody would ever want to go to war. Um, so, you know, it's easy, again, to, to put Chamberlain as this like a foolish figure in history, but um, at the same time, you know, he didn't think anybody necessarily would want to go to war. And again, that would probably would have been popular opinion. But in hindsight, of course, this was a bad policy um, and the Allies are going to pay for it, you know, um, here shortly. And he also wanted to get in on the action. He thought to himself, isn't there a not yet colonized nation somewhere which is so underdeveloped that the people would be defending themselves against our tanks with literal bows and arrows and wooden spears? <laughs> oh, there is? Fantastic. And so he took it. Yep. Italy also wanted to control the entrance to the Adriatic Sea, so they occupied Albania. Then, in another incident which was maybe staged by the Japanese, gunfire was exchanged by Japanese and Chinese troops at the Marco Polo Bridge, and the Japanese launched yet another invasion against China. They swept through Beijing and Shanghai, and then advanced through the Yangtze Valley to China's then capital, Nanking. It was here that saw the worst of Japan's shocking atrocities committed against the Chinese people. Back in Europe, Germany and Italy the rape of Nanking as they, uh, as it's called now is something that I think in the West would have been, or would be today way more popularized if not for the Holocaust. Right. And unfortunately I think has got swept under the rug, especially by Western culture, but don't tell that to the Chinese, um, because it was a very awful time period for the Chinese. Italy made their relationship status official by signing the Pact of Steel. Then, Hitler turned his eyes towards Poland and the hated Polish corridor splitting Germany in two. At this point, the Allies really had to put their foot down, and they warned him that an invasion of Poland would mean war. Hitler had planned to continue his advance eastward, but he didn't want to end up fighting a war on two fronts. So for now, he made an alliance with Stalin, saying, How about we both invade Poland and split it between the two of us, and I definitely won't not refrain from not betraying you sometime in the future. Sounds... <laughs> good. This new alliance stunned the West. On the 1st of September... Some historical context that's very interesting. Um, Poland, as you see right here, uh, did not exist until after World War One. at least not in the, the sense that it does now. Um, it used to be part German territory and part Russian territory, right? And after World War I, um, these areas were granted self-determination or the ability to basically create their own nations. So this was an easy, I think, bargaining... Uh, 
peace here that Hitler was able to make with with uh, uh, with Stalin there, and that hey, we both have something that historically has been ours. Would be very hard to convince Stalin, to, you know, to do this sort of thing. And of course, Hitler would love this too because if there is going to be a war you know having to fight two fronts was something that he knows as a former world war one um, soldier that was very difficult especially early on in world war one having to fight two fronts so if there is going to be a war um, not having to fight russia in the east would be a very very helpful thing so kind of everyone wins with this situation you're talking about germany and russia um, but unfortunately poland itself is going to see itself, as you see here, um, invaded by two countries. So that is uh, how this thing's whole this whole thing is going to start here, as far as the military intervention. September 1939, German troops entered Poland, and Britain and France declared war on Germany. The Poles the fought hard, but the they were no match drawn. for the two giants crashing down on them from either side. Then came a period known as the Phony War, where everyone just sort of sat around not doing much. <coughs> the French had launched a small invasion into the Saarland, but they maintained mostly defensive positions, and after a while, decided to just turn around and call it a day. Speaking of France, the French were still super proud of their victory in World War I, and they hadn't really moved on from it. They still used horses, they dispatched messages by motorbike instead of using radio, orders from the commander-in-chief were usually pretty vague, and the troops were rarely inspected. They built a line of defenses along their German border, but didn't bother extending it all the way to the channel. And they wouldn't launch artillery strikes against Germany out of fear of being retaliated against. So the Maginot Line right here. But, uh, France, of course, gets a bad rap uh, as well in this war because they were technologically inferior when it came to the military to, to Germany, who had been advancing their military, right? In World War I, you get the introduction of tanks and uh, machine guns and airplanes which were again all in their kind of infancy especially tanks and airplanes and throughout this interwar period these couple decades um, germany had been advancing that technology the tank and air air war technology uh, way faster than anybody else and when this war breaks out france is still in basically world war one mode which uh, doesn't work in the modern war era that that germany has now brought in so you see with them they they invest um for their kind of post-world war one you know response to world war uh, or to the war they invest in a uh, defense system now the maginot line is one of the greatest defense structures ever built i mean it's really a marvel um, however, like you see here, you see how the Maginot Line, which again, is just it's defensive fortifications. Um, look into it more if you want to learn more. It really is fascinating. But you can see the um, the defense only goes across the French and uh, German border. Now, of course, what we know in World War One is that Germany avoided this border anyways by going through Belgium, which is easier to travel than the more forested mountainous areas right here. But again, the Maginot Line did not extend all the way up north. Now, I believe they had plans to possibly extend that down the road, but they felt, you know, the German-French border would be far more important than building, you know, the most fortified defensive structure ever along a border of a nation you are friendly with, with Belgium, which, I don't know, maybe give some bad uh, vibes off if you're doing that sort of thing against or uh, with a, a border with an ally but nevertheless um this is not going to really do much in in the end the way to the channel and they wouldn't launch artillery strikes against germany out of fear of being retaliated against in a war they didn't want to attack the enemy and at first the uk wasn't much better chamberlain still naively hoped that the war could be ended diplomatically instead of bombing raids the raf dropped propaganda leaflets over german cities which one air marshal said likely did nothing but provide the continent with toilet paper for the duration of the war they also only sent 200,000 men to france while the french had mobilized millions both britain and france wanted to avoid a repeat of the first world war and so they wanted to keep the war as far from home as possible so they turned their eyes north towards norway Neutral Sweden was exporting iron ore to Germany through neutral Norway, so the Allies asked them if they could please stop exporting iron ore to Germany, but this request was refused. Then, the Soviet Union Money attacked Finland, right? so the Allies said, how about we land troops in Norway and move them across Sweden to go help out your good pal Finland, and along the way maybe take control of all your armfields. But Norway and Sweden still said no, so the UK mined the waters around Norway to force any transport ships into international waters, and they also attacked a German tanker they found in the area. Hitler realized what the Allies were up to, and he quickly moved to secure his supply of iron ore. He launched an invasion through Denmark into Norway. The Allies rushed to land troops at key ports along the coast, but Germany had taken control of Norway's airfield, and their air superiority decided the fight. The Allies had to retreat. 
After this slightly embarrassing failure, Chamberlain resigned and was replaced with Winston Churchill, who had a slightly different approach to dealing with the Germans. Hitler's overall strategy was similar to Germany. Yeah, Winston Churchill had been one of the very few voices um, in, in Europe here on the Allied side that wanted to take a much stronger stance to Hitler early on and opposed appeasement and, um, you know, from the, from the, from the get go, uh, because he's, you know, he thought you can't appease someone like Hitler if you're just, you're, you're giving your whole hand away and you're, um, you'll, you'll never be able to appease Hitler at someone like that. Once you give them something, they're going to want more and more. So this made, of course, Churchill look like a warmonger and was dismissed. Now, now that appeasement has failed, all of a sudden people are going, Hey, that Churchill guy, I, I think he was right. You know what I mean? So he's going to now be in charge. Um, but his worry of course is, is it too late, um, to, to do anything here? So let's continue. Germany's First World War strategy. Attack France, defeat France, knocking out the UK in the process, then turn on the Soviet Union and win the war. During the phony war, the Allies had given Hitler time to prepare his forces. Now, he was ready to attack. The Allies had wanted to place troops in Belgium, but Belgium had refused. And in a move that surprised pretty much no one, Hitler launched an invasion to get around France's defenses. The Allies charged into Belgium at full speed to meet the German invasion head on. And it looked like a repeat of the First World War was coming. Just but this like time, World Hitler war. had a trick up his sleeve. Blitzkrieg. As the Germans advanced, they sent thousands of refugees westward, slowing down the Allies. Then, to the south, the French had left the Ardennes, an area full of hills and forests, pretty underdefended because they thought it was naturally impenetrable. Well, the Germans were about to penetrate it with everything they had. They smashed 50 Wehrmacht divisions through and encircled the Allied armies at lightning speed. The best of the Allied forces were now trapped. The Germans squeezed in from all sides, taking out France's best armies and nearly wiping out the British too. But they managed to make a desperate last minute escape at Dunkirk, with British civilian ships even making the perilous journey to bring their young men home. With most of the French forces depleted, the Germans breezed yeah. through, taking Paris and France fell. What the Germans couldn't do in World War I, Hitler had done just like that. Yep. Really, when it comes down to invading France, and, and basically Western Europe in general, um, mainland Western Europe is, it's Paris. Everything is Paris. Um, if Europe, you know, has a, has a center, a, a power center as a, as a continent, um, Paris is kind of it, especially with France. I mean, if you take Paris, France is kind of done. And that's what in World War I the Germans were trying to do is, you know, invade in the north there to try to get Paris and to get very close, but never do. But now it has happened here within a matter of weeks. And without Paris, uh, France is basically gone. So at this point, very early in the war, which is still early in the war, um, they have made more progress, Germany has, than by far all of, of World War I um, on the Western Front. So from here on out, you know, it's not going to be a repeat of World War I. Hitler hoped that with the fall of France, the UK would also lose hope and sue for peace. But quite annoyingly, it didn't, and he needed to secure the Western Front, so he tried to force them into submission with mind games. The UK were now all alone, and Hitler wanted to emphasize that. First of all, just before France fell, Italy finally declared war on the Allies, making the UK's situation even worse. Next, instead of just occupying all of France, Hitler occupied the coastal areas for defense, but allowed France to continue its existence as a German puppet state. This way, it looked like the UK's old ally really had decided to switch anymore. sides. Hitler also hoped that the UK wouldn't attack any of her old allies navy bases or colonies in Africa, giving Hitler an extra line of defense to the south, but the UK made sure to respond to this by sailing down to France's navy base in Algeria and wrecking a bunch of ships. So have at it. Hitler then began laying down plans for an invasion of Great Britain before German troops could land on British soil. He would first need air and naval superiority across the channel. Waves of German bombers came while the completely outnumbered RAF worked bravely around the clock in an attempt to quell the German attacks. At first, the Luftwaffe targeted British ports and coastal facilities. Then it attacked RAF bases, crippling the RAF's ability to defend the nation. And it looked like Hitler's Great British invasion was coming. But then, Churchill ordered a small, pretty insignificant bombing raid over Berlin. It didn't do much damage, but Hitler was furious, and he immediately ordered ordered the Luftwaffe to refocus its attacks on civilian targets in London. Children were sent off to the countryside, away from their parents to avoid danger, and frequent trips to air raid shelters became a daily occurrence. But British morale held firm. Smiling, knitting, lounging casually, these people have balls of steel. This refocusing on London also gave the RAF breathing space to reorganize, so Hitler kind of shot himself in the foot there. Just the foot for now. Finally, the Luftwaffe sent a massive all-out attack on London, and the RAF successfully repelled it, destroying many of the German aircraft and placing air superiority firmly in British hands. Hitler's invasion had to be postponed, but the bombing of British cities continued for some time. 
Yeah, the Blitz, as it's called here, bombing of London and other areas, uh, was a major, major test for the British uh, because the Germans are launching Blitzkrieg, right? Now, Blitzkrieg is in three, basically three waves. Um, the first thing, of course, is the air war. Um, it's you bomb round the clock um, on military sites as, you know, primarily, and you can go on civilian sites like he's going to do here. And you have to soften up the, the, the land, I guess, in a way that eventually you can safely land uh, or invade with, with uh, on land. Now, the next phase after you conduct the uh, with the Luftwaffe, the air raids, is to, of course, land your uh, mechanized warfare right your tanks and stuff like that now this is of course a big challenge for with britain because it's an island right where it worked basically seamlessly in france and in poland this is different this raid has to be successful otherwise you can't get to the third and final phase which is against to to put troops um eventually on ground so they have to withstand this if they can withstand the bombing then really the germans will not be able to progress with an actual invasion so they had to you know stand firm here otherwise it could be over and england could go the way of france if they don't okay looks like that's it now um i want to make sure credit gets you know, to the oversimplified uh, people here. This channel, um, this is the first time I've seen this video, but uh, I know this channel is very popular and I really like what they did there. It's always great to, you know, add the humor and the visuals and the the uh, animations are, are great. So I think this is a great way to introduce yourself, you know, into a topic here. So, but I want to make sure that you go to their video and like and subscribe there. Uh, much more important that you do that than for me. I didn't make this content. I'm just reacting to it and talking about it so we got to make sure to give credit where it's due so if you only want to do one like today do it to the oversimplified people okay all right well uh pretty soon here we'll do part two and uh we'll look at that now if you have any other history related videos that you would like me to uh to check out um, be sure to leave them in the comments and i'll try to get to it and uh we'll go ahead and uh, we'll see you next time